Neuroscience Working Group, or FNWG, of the Advisory Council of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, or NINDS. I'm Christina Nigro, Chief of Staff to the NINDS Director, Dr. Walter Koroshek, who I'll introduce shortly. This webinar will be recorded, and the video recording will be posted to the NINDS FNWG webpage once available, along with the slides presented today. I'll post the link to the webpage in the chat following my remarks. Closed captioning is available by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Over this next hour, you'll hear introductory remarks from Dr. Koroshek, an overview of the working group's charge, process, and timeline from the NINDS Director of Division of Neuroscience, Dr. Lynn Jakeman, and a summary of the working group's deliberations and draft summary recommendations from the working group's co-chairs, Dr. Yishi Chan and Dr. Tim, Tim Ryan. We will end with a Q&A session and feedback session from webinar attendees. Please post your question or comment in the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Questions will be addressed in the order in which they are received. If you're also invited to provide input on the draft recommendations, the IMDS Fundamental Neuroscience Mailbox, FN at NIH.gov. Email info received by August 1st will be considered by the working group in their final deliberations before presenting their report and recommendations to the NINDS Advisory Council on September 6th. The September 6th presentation is also open to the public and we'll tell you where to watch that at the close of the webinar. Now, I'm pleased to introduce the director of NINDS, Dr. Walter Gorshevs. Thanks very much, Christina. And uh, maybe it might go on mute because we're pretty close to each other. Um, well, I welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, this is really important uh, for NINDS. Um, and uh, the reason why is uh, that we are desperately reliant on improving our fundamental knowledge about the brain and the nervous system um, because uh, without you know, filling in these huge gaps of ignorance, um, we're, we're really behind the eight ball in trying to improve the neurological health of all people. Um, our research um, is motivated, particularly on the discovery side, by the, the curiosity-driven uh, investigations that go on around the country. Uh, and um, every time we start to focus on a disease mechanism, uh, what we usually find is that it's way more complicated than we originally thought, and that we uh, we uh, basically uncover uh, areas of basic fundamental neuroscience that we don't really understand well. And, uh, and that really impedes this uh, movement towards uh, developing better treatments for people with these really tragic disorders that we're all trying to work on. Um, now, what we asked the group to do, and this is a group that's tied to our uh, uh, NINDS Council, is to think about how we can do better as an institute and potentially as a community of scientists uh, to accelerate the advancement of our fundamental understanding of the nervous system. Uh, I must say that um, some of the impetus for this came from the BRAIN Initiative, which is really focused you know, very heavily on understanding basic neural circuits and, and what we found is that the development of tools to do so has completely revolutionized that system's neuroscience. But that's only one piece of neuroscience. And so the Fundamental Neuro Neuroscience Working Group was charged with looking at, at our basic, basic neuroscience in toto and coming up with a strategic um, set of recommendations that can move our science forward uh, faster and more effectively. And really appreciate the work that's been done by the group. Um, uh, clearly, um, you can't boil the ocean. You have to you know, pick what you think are the, the sweet spots uh, where, uh, we can, where we can move uh, a, a field uh, faster given our current state of science. We can't do everything, but uh, I think you will hear 
a very scholarly, uh, well thought out a set of recommendations. And we look forward um, to your comments on these recommendations as they proceed through the approval process at our council. So with that, I'd like to, um, to end and turn it over uh, to our co-chairs. Great. Um, thank you, Walter. And before we turn it to the co-chairs, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Lynn Jakeman, and I'm the director of the Division of Neuroscience, which um, oversees much of the fundamental research funded by the NINDS. Um, and I just wanted to provide a little context for the formation of the working group. Um, Dr. Korshetz just talked a little bit about the reasons for forming this working group. But some of the context, um, many of you may know that about 10 years ago, NINDS took a very close look at our funding and support for basic research as part of our larger research grant portfolio. And one of the things that was noted was a precipitous drop in the percentage of grants um, and uh, the amount of money being invested in fundamental neuroscience versus the applied research areas. Um, this ranged from about 1997 until about 2010. And since then, um, we've, uh, we've dedicated a number of internal efforts to focus on this part of our portfolio to ensure that it doesn't slide further. And I'm happy to say that funding has been stable in this area since about 2011 at about 30% of all of our awards or about an average of 940 grants a year. Um, but the biggest lesson we learned from all of this is we cannot be complacent in our attention to this part of our portfolio. Unless we're vigilant, vigilant and constantly promoting and focusing on fundamental neuroscience, it could drop precipitously again. Uh, next slide, please. So um, about two years ago, this group of internal NINDS staff came together and began to address the question of how we can continue to be vigilant with um, addressing fundamental neuroscience research is the combination of program staff, staff from the Office of Science Policy and Planning, and our communications office. So thanks to all of these folks. Um, next slide, please. So some of the things that the group has done is to continue our evaluation of the research funding by research type. Um, also an evaluation of a, um, an effort we did to promote basic research with a program announcement. Um, this group has also worked with Dr. Korshetz to make sure that we're messaging properly and developed a director's message on fostering research in fundamental neuroscience. They created a one-stop webpage for current information and resources. Um, we posted a request for information from the public on advancing research in fundamental neuroscience. Um, and we have also played a big role in supporting the Fundamental Neuroscience Working Group of Council that you're here from today. Next slide, please. So what, how we formed this group was um, to really focus on making sure we had a diverse group of fundamental neuroscience researchers from the extramural community that could help inform us primarily in terms of qualitatively, what are we missing? What are the gaps? What are the opportunities in this area? So the things we, um, we looked at were to make sure that we had geographic diversity, that we had diversity in gender, in size of institution, in career stage, um, and developed a working group um, roster, which we um, then forwarded to our two liaisons who are the co-chairs, Dr. Uh, Yishi Jin and Tim Ryan. Um, they further um, uh, tweaked uh, the list a little bit. And we were looking for a group to do the following things, and these will be animated to identify opportunities that NINDS could take to facilitate innovation and enable discoveries or accelerate discoveries we're not currently addressing, to consider specific recommendations, and you'll hear about those today. Next. Um, to evaluate how we are currently supporting and how we might support the development and refinement of technologies, approaches, or resources, and to prepare a draft report of findings so the culmination of this work will be presented to the full NINDS Council on September 6th. Next slide, please. So this is the group that has worked over the course of the last six months together, um, led by Yishi Jin and Tim Ryan. Um, we have a few members of this group on the panel today. Um, Mark Friedman, Kelsey Barton, and um, Linda Richards are on, the, are on their panel today. The others are listening in as attendees as you are. Next slide, please. And the charge of the group um, was to do the following, to look to the future of fundamental neuroscience, to begin to explore what the critical gaps, key unanswered questions and new opportunities might be, to evaluate the effectiveness and potential of current programs, 
and to propose and prioritize concepts and strategies. Um, so with no further ado, I would like to turn this over to our co-chairs to share with you the recommendations. Oh, I think there's another slide with the timeline. So the timeline, excuse the, the myth there. Um, we began these conversations about a year and a half ago. Um, the committee has been meeting since December. Today is the public webinar. You will, there will be an opportunity to post recommendations um, through August 1st of 2023. And then this draft report will go to the council, um, the NINDF council in September. And at that point, we will be able to post the final document and begin implementation. Okay, now I will turn it over to the co-chair. Thank you. Um, thanks, Lynn. Um, so I will start with an expanded timeline for the working group to give you an overview and a summary of how the working group deliberation um, process. So we kick off the uh, working group meeting in January uh, this year and followed with a four monthly meetings and um, where the working group basically defined the goals and identify unaddressed uh, key questions, evaluate new research opportunities. And then finally, we made a draft recommendation by the end of June. So um, as we speak, um, we welcome your questions and comments and please do email in inputs by August 1st, which is next Tuesday. Uh, next slide, yeah. So clearly the starting question for Tim and I is uh, fundamental neuroscience covers a huge area of research. So what should we focus on? Uh, we chose to focus on cellular and molecular neuroscience. As we know, and we hope you agree, that the past decade, particularly thanks to the Brain Initiative, um, there have been huge progress on brain connectomics and as well as the rapid expansion of single cell transcriptomes, so which has enabled us to learn so many types of um, cells in the nervous system, as well as the fine details of uh, neuronal connections and various neural circuits. So we really feel that it's time to actually think about how to place molecules onto structures or cellular machineries that make a cell in the nervous system functional and to also define their spatial temporal dynamics over the lifetime of an intact nervous system. And as the fundamental uh, neuroscience working groups are experts of broad areas of cellular neuroscience. So can we have the next? Um, Right. So we, um, to facilitate in-depth the evaluation of the current research progress and future potentials, we we'll assign the members as pairs or trios on seven topic area. And these are development, um, genomic organization, gene regulation, cell-cell inter-tissue interaction, metabolism, lipid stasis, and atomic organization of channels and the machineries drive uh, ne neurons function, as well as the subcellular organizations in space. And we further ask, next slides, uh, each subgroup to consider four questions. These are four, uh, what are the critical knowledge gaps in the subtopic area? How can we foster fundamental mechanistic investigations in that area? and what are the technology choke points in that area? What are potential perceived uh, funding difficulties? Next slide. Um, on the second meeting, February, um, basically each subgroup um, brought in and identified many knowledge gaps in each topic, which I can only give you a glimpse of um, on the slides and in this webinar. So for instance, on development, which by definition involves cell-cell in interaction, inter-tissue interaction. The nervous system is incredible complex organ with many cell types, both in central and peripheral nervous system. The gaps we identified such as how do all cell types interact and then communicate to shape the fate of other cells and then further to maintain adaptive changes uh, in adults. 
And it was noted that the peripheral nervous system has been historically understudied. There are clearly a need for better in vivo imaging of developmental process over time, so can so that we can catch you know the signals and the cells to coordinate developmental process. And next one, and on the genomic and gene regulation and the classical or has been traditional individual investigator driven research is a focus on a single gene, unidentified gene changes, and the gaps we identified, such as how do multiple uh, molecular pathways interact to change the function of nervous system. And given there's a big list of generated from genomic data, uh, how do we promote and generate a more productive action to understand the gene organization? And the subcellular organization, atomic organization, this is a really fascinating that we all know um, neurons and many types of cells have incredible morphology carry out a very local and spatially controlled actions. So what are the molecular networks that produce called in the subcellular organization? How can they be identified at very high resolution and to allow tracking them uh, over time? And what is the composition um, specificity, um, such as molecular ion channel clusters? Next one, regarding metabolism and lipostasis are topics that's very important um, to the brain function. As we know, uh, the brain has high demand on energy, and uh, metabolism also depends on brain state. Lipid are numerous in species and play versatile roles in ensure uh, cell integrity, modulate the signaling, as well as compartmentalized action. So what are the metabolic rules that govern brain functions and animal behavior? And how is metabolism as well as lipid signaling integrated with other signaling pathways to drive neural function? And what are the decision points that trigger uh, lipid turnover or buildup to support a neuron function. So next slides. And on the second question, how can we foster fundamental neuroscience mechanistic investigation? And in all subtopics, um, the subgroups essentially came up with a similar recommendation. That is um, to prioritize the need to understand basic biology first, not focus on disease, to really emphasize basic cell biology, neuronal metabolism, in vivo electrophysiology, and signaling. And then second is to foster collaborations between neuroscientists and other experts outside of neuroscience, such as biochemists, metabolism experts, engineers, to support technology, methodological development research. And additionally, and the working group really think we need to encourage use of non-traditional model systems to study basic cellular biological processes that's relevant to neurons and to embrace more exploratory science. To the third question, what are the technology choke points um, in the topic area? And this is probably regardless which um, area and the working group also feel that we need robust and accurate indicators uh, with good temporal spatial resolution to measure everything and to track a signaling cascades in vivo and to develop sensors for every signaling pathway, particularly genetically encoded sensors and tools to manipulate the signaling in vivo with the functional readouts. For the last question, uh, what are perceived funding difficulties? Um, understandably, uh, the answers uh, generally depended on personal or institutional experience. Nonetheless, we have shared um, points, such as we feel that we need more experts who are able to evaluate the curiosity-driven technology development research. And there should be ways to um, in enable equitable access to state-of-the-art imaging and core facilities. Additionally, um, the group uh, identified that there has to be ways to sustain, to come up with a sustained support for uh, staff scientists, particularly the experts, technology experts, uh, to develop uh, methodologies to maintain core facilities. 
So um, over just a second, and over the next um, uh, three meetings, the working group basically zoomed into each area to discuss how to best address the knowledge gaps. We all agreed one of the goals of molecular neuroscience is to understand the machinery that allows all types of cells in the nervous system to orchestrate and the sustain functions over the lifetime of an organism. And we highly recommend uh, developing new tools together with enhancing cross interdisciplinary interactions is essential to enable mechanistic leaps to our understanding of the development and function of the nervous system. Now I'm going to hand the slides over to Tim and to deliver the recommendation. So we, we came up with, um, sort of boil it down to sort of five recommendations. Some are a little bit overlapping and connected. I'm not gonna present it in an order of importance. We consider them all equally important. Uh, but the first one, um, which, which we really think will help fuel sort of future advances, is we recognize the need to fill in this information gap of the organization of protein machineries in brain cells in this length scale that we typically don't have very good access to, which is sort of in the, the one nanometer to roughly one micron uh, length scale. Uh, and it's, it's because our, our brains are trying to fill this in when we come up with mechanistic ideas but we actually don't have the information in general. In, case, in some cases we do, but on the whole, we don't. And this is really motivated by advances that were made 70 years ago in electron microscopy as sort of the template for what led to a revolution in thinking in, in cell biology as well as neuroscience. Uh, for example, the electron microscopy in the 1950s, could someone click on the next, um, yep, there we go. Th this is an example where it wasn't at the molecular level, but it was, it was in this era where the methods had become sufficiently controlled for doing staining, cutting tissue sections. They coupled that with sort of clever structure function ideas where they knew when to look, is that they made fundamental discoveries that, that drove investigations for the next 70 years. Um, and this example here is one from Keith Porter, a famous example. It was actually the discovery of clathrin mediated endocytosis. Now, those words weren't applied at the time because there were no proteins known. But this is an experiment done in a pulse chase experiment. So this was in a, a mosquito oocyte of uh, seven hours after a blood meal where they, they knew that to, they expected that the oocytes were being fed something um, in, in the next stage. So this was this was a very clever experiment. So they, they knew when to look. It was a, a real pulse chase experiment. The, the next, um, click the next slide, thanks. Right, so this was what, what they're seeing for the first time. They identified these engulfments going on at the plasma membrane. And of course, this, this drove curiosity going forward for, for many years, which is particular to isolate what were the proteins that did this, what role do they have, et cetera. This is the kind of thing that we, we feel is when you get down, like this scale is at the nanometer to micron scale, but there are no molecules involved. It's been extremely hard to get molecular information on this length scale sort of within this context. And we feel that this is likely to be ripe for huge advancements. One uh, now sort of old example that's 40 years old is on the next slide, which was I would call the sort of the first example of molecular cartography in the nervous system. Uh, next slide. And this was uh, the identification following the, the molecular discovery biochemical in the late 1970s of the protein synapsin, a nerve terminal protein, it was suspected to be associated with nerve terminal synaptic vesicles, but the definitive proof came from this kind of heroic experiment carried out by Pietro Di Camilli and Paul Greengard's lab, which was doing immunogold labeling and electron microscopy. Now, this is a tough task. It's, this is an extremely high quality one. It's an abundant protein. It was probably easier than most, still difficult. But this provided definitive proof that they were dealing with something that associated primarily with synaptic vesicles. And this is the kind of thing that we, we strive to have for lots of biology that's just quite difficult. And because this is a, a very low throughput technique. So now the good news is in the last uh, few years, there's been great advancements. But we, we think that the going forward, the, the idea would be to try and approach, try to understand the organization of key sets of molecules. And I'm just gonna give you two examples. These are not prioritized, they're just glaring examples of things that we wish we understood the organization a little better. Next slide, please. So for example, sort of the idea would be to pick 
your favorite sets of machinery for controlling the biology you might care about most in the nervous system. And then trying to examine this on this meso scale of sort of one to one micron and seeing how it's organized. And I'll give you, I'm going to give you two examples. The first one, the next slide, um, it's something we terribly important to understand, which is the machinery for building lipid membranes. So this is an example of a structure of the fatty acid synthase complex. The, that structure is understood to a certain extent. Where this is located in neurons or other types of cells in the brain has never really been studied, right? And so understanding how this is organized and for decisions is terribly important for how you build membranes. Another example, which I'll come to in, in a few more slides, but the, click the next slide, is the machinery associated with turning over proteins. So this is an example of the proteasome. It's, we have sophisticated biochemical knowledge. This is an actual cartoon of a structure of the 26X proteasome. But detailed understanding of where this is located in detail at specific locales within neural tissue um, is, is not well understood. I mean, it's, it's exactly this kind of thing where we, if we knew where this was and where it was located in detail with respect to a few other things, we feel it would sort of spark the imaginations of future mechanistic studies. Now, this is easier said than done in principle, because I just mentioned that uh, immuno-EM was a pretty slow throughput technique and hard to pull off. The good news is in the last five to 10 years, there have been tremendous advances that we think can now catalyze future work. So the, the next slide shows an example, which is this, um, to fill in this gap, right? Which is, here's an example of a cartoon. This is a, a great illustration from Good Cell that people see in many examples where he's, he's filled in the, how crowded the nature of cytoplasms are. This is an example of, of two different nerve terminals, but uh, what we really don't know is the identity molecularly of most of the stuff that's packing the surface. So this is what we strive to understand is where are the key things we care about, not necessarily everything, but pick your favorite subset of things you're trying to work on and map it on this length scale. So how is this going to happen? The next slide. So the what's so the sorry, just back a slide. I, I want to emphasize something. So the idea for this recommendation is to prioritize research that fosters filling in this information gap on the nanometer scale of molecular organization, but really connected to function, right? So you pick the things you functionally think are important, and then that's the motivation for how to dig in where you want to look and which sets of things you want to look at. How to do this is illustrated on the next slide. Um, so there's been tremendous advances in light microscopy. Uh, a few different things have now combined to make things possible that were never possible before. For example, Expansion microscopy and super resolution microscopy, when combined together, allows one to investigate things at, at, with you know, antibodies and light microscopes of much higher throughput than ever before possible. This image on the left is actually an electron micrograph of a centriole, in this case, in Chlamydomitis. It, it happens to have this, this gorgeous organization of microtubules. Uh, and so this is sort of a template. It's been now been possible to get the same level of now with molecular identity and resolution at the light level, the next slide doing this combination of expansion microscopy and super resolution. This, this example shows you basically, even in detail, of a, a tag tubulin, something that's been polyglutaminated, recognized by one type of antibody versus sort of generic alpha tubulin. And you can even see those things that we could not see before at the EM level, because we didn't have tools that could go in and identify molecular characteristics. The fact that this is at the same length scale is astounding and, and really, this is a field that has exploded just in the last five years with these combinations. So this holds tremendous promise for trying to go forward to map out details like this on this sort of many nanometer scale within a neural tissue. Uh, next slide. Now, the striving will be to go to more intact brain environments. Obviously, this is all fixed dynamic. It's fixed in time. It'll be, you know, a fixed cell mapping of some kind. So we're going to give up a time dimension. But what we would like to recover is to be able to do this within the native tissue. Now, that's the example I showed you was done in a very clean environment of a centriole being looked on a cover slip under a microscope. But there's also hope on this frontier. This is an example of a paper from Carl Svoboda's lab at the Allen Institute of a brand new technology. This is just on BioArchive, where they've been able to carry out the first pass of a whole brain expansion microscopy was sort of, they were going after a slightly different goal, which was to map very wide brain areas at, at really good resolution. This particular case, you know, they're sort of achieving the 100 nanometer scale resolution, but at whole brain scale for the first time. There's really no reason to believe this can't be pushed at least another factor of two, maybe in another factor of five. 
So uh, it, this is all sort of feasibility studies that are going on. So I, I think it's going to be possible to look at this macromolecular detail from intact brain tissue within the next handful of years. So that's why this is a, one of our recommendations. Next slide. Now, the other thing that uh, was very apparent is the need for tools on many scales. And so one, one other big problem that uh, we can highlight is that the challenge in, in neural tissue is that we're dealing with cells, next slide, that you know, must last in a human eight to 10 decades. They also happen to be amongst the biggest cells in your body. So individual neurons, specifically projection axons, travel and they course through the cortex. In a, even in a mouse, that may be up to tens of centimeters worth of axon. So it, it brings up this issue of you know, how do you deal with the part turnover situation? And, and this is something we really don't understand very well. And we really think that we will learn a lot from fostering research in this area. Next slide. So I, I call this that we, we know there's been a few studies from in a variety of systems, both from in vitro neurons all the way to in vivo, trying to come up with estimates of the lifetimes of proteins. Generally, that requires a biochemical type assay where you're grinding up tissue doing some kind of heavy amino acid labeling, et cetera. But it brings up this interest. And so we know, you know the scale is somewhere from hours to months, depending on the protein of the turnover time. But it brings up this more fundamental question of how do you keep a neuron working where you're constantly changing the parts? And a colleague of mine came up with this analogy. Where it's, like, it's like riding a bicycle where you constantly need to be fixing it while you're riding it. And you can't, can't pull it off to the side of the road to fix the flat. You've got to be keeping it working. So these are concepts we've sort of only begun to scrape the surface of. So on the next slide, it illustrates this other problem of the distance scale. So again, borrowing this image from a, a few slides ago of a, a particular axon that has coursed very far distances away from the cell body. It's like, what are the, the rules for replacing parts that are so far away from the cell body? You know, the nucleus is where you have all the DNA. You have to make decisions about how are you going to figure out when you need to replace parts and how you're going to do it. And we're just scraping the surface of this. So this is, a, I think, a very important aspect of this. Next slide. The good news is there are technologies that have just begun to emerge. Here's another example of a, of a joint, as a paper that's on BioArchive from a, a joint project uh, from a group at Genelia um, that used to be with Carl Svoboda, but where they figured out a, a very clever new chemical toolkit. This is an example where they're able to map PSD95 lifetimes across brain regions for the first time. Uh, and this is sort of using both clever tagging tools and chemistry to do the kind of labeling and turnover. So this is just one example. It may not work for all examples you want, but it gives us hope that this is now an approachable problem in the next handful of years. Next slide. Uh, Jen brought up the issue of sort of lipid biology. I want to illustrate a, a slightly different piece of the problem, which is many neurons are are the, probably that have the largest lipid reserve in some ways or lipid content of any cells in the body. Just two examples are oligodendrocytes and projection neurons. So that these things are not only they have you know huge plasma membrane expanses, but almost all these cells in addition have internal organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum, which is almost another set of membrane of equal in size. And so how a cell deals with building the lipid for this, what the decisions are, where it's done, uh, is something we, we haven't really approached because it's been technically very difficult. So here we're a little further away. We're hoping we can encourage tool development for this type of problem. There are some tools people have, it's not zero attention. The next slide shows an example of sort of clever chemical approaches for going after this. So the, the question is, what are the rules for lipid building, delivery turnover? How does this intersect with signaling role for lipids and we need new technologies. And, and an example of an emerging technology that gives me hope is on the next slide. Uh, is sort of again, chemists to the rescue. These are azobenzene switches on lipids that uh, after a switch, they become accessible to dye labeling on the outer surface of the membrane, which could, you could imagine in a focal fashion, this allows you to create tracers. So you could begin to study fluxes and movement of lipids and, and you know, if you knew where you'd want to manipulate other machineries. So th this could be very powerful. Next slide. Um, again, uh, the, the concept of metabolism was brought up. We, we many of us feel this is a, a very ripe area. It's incredibly impactful. Next slide. And this is because there's a very close connection between metabolic and cognitive states in humans. There, we are very intolerant to interruptions in fuel supply. And so this just 
and, and neurodegeneration is sort of is often closely linked with these metabolic problems. So it brings up the issue that we really don't understand the metabolic rules very well in most neural tissues. And this is because, next slide, standard methods that have been grown enormously in areas like cancer biology in the last decade are difficult to apply because neural tissue is a complex mixture of different cell types. And so the methods that are used for standard sort of this is an example of sort of mass spec and metabolite tracing approaches are very difficult to implement and disentangle and interpret correctly when you've got, you know you have a mixture of tissues in various metabolic states. So we have to be more creative coming up with this. Again, I think there's, there's reason for great hope in this. Next slide, which is tool development in this area has really begun to grow a lot. And so I think we're, we're encouraging tool development that and in addition, ones that need to be optimized so that not only does it work in one example in a cell in a dish, but it may need extra work to get it to work in vivo because that usually that's the next stage of improvement. And we're encouraging things that not just for the obvious metabolic things, which are clearly important things like bioenergetics and redox state, but as well as important molecules that we now know lie kind of at critical intersection points between anabolism and catabolism at the single cell level. These will be terribly informative to try and understand the orchestration of metabolism and how it controls brain function. The good news is, as I said, chemists have been paying attention to this in general. And I think there's in the next five years, I'm quite confident lots of new powerful tools are emerging. The next slide. Uh, this is just one example from a paper that came out literally about a month ago in Nature Chemical Biology from Kai Johnson's group in Germany, where they developed sort of a new framework for developing new chemical indicators for metabolites. Um, in this case, it's best on a sort of halo tagging. Uh, it looks incredibly promising. I encourage people to look at it. It may not, you know, it hasn't been deployed in vivo, but um, ideas like this, I think, are going to emerge. Next slide, please. So, uh, Jen. I hand back to me. So all these uh, previous recommendations that we just talked about will absolutely enhance our understanding of the nervous system organization in an unprecedented um, resolution under submicron. Uh, we also know that the nervous system is a huge um, organ and has many different cell types. Ultimately, we wanted to place those uh, subcellular structures into the context of a whole organisms, uh, a whole nervous system development. And the cellular complexity and the physiology complexity of the nervous system is clear to everyone as a several, the images that I'm showing here from my colleagues on the working group and showing the beauty and the complexity and the incredible other and the interactions of um, uh, different uh, in fly and fish and in mice. So we came up with a recommendation is to support in vivo approaches to capture and imaging cell-cell interaction during the development of the organism as long as uh, the organism is alive. And um, we made this uh, recommendation in part because uh, there are um, technologies available and to allow long-term imaging. Additionally, we consider that improved um, understanding of the peripheral nervous system will provide um, insights not only for how particular innovation happens, also enhance our understanding is how the nervous system controls uh, bodily function. And besides um, the traditional model organisms and the working group emphasize that researchers who are actually working with the new model organisms, perhaps a very simple non-canonical uh, organisms that are much more uh, poised to rapidly elucidate uh, key developmental events. And they can use their fundings to illuminate evolution and conserved mechanism in humans. So next slide, um, along with the scientific recommendations, and that is, yes, you heard here, is they all are involving team science. And the working group calls for uh, um, initiatives to promote interdisciplinary team science and collaborations. And um, would like to recommend perhaps novel collaborations with experts outside of neuroscience and need to be incentivized and for example, through shared um, develop funding mechanisms with between NNDS and other institutes at NIH and uh, centers at NIH. 
And we recognize the need to um, somehow um, provide sustained support for technical experts, such as scientists that engage in tool development or involved in supporting uh, science infrastructure facilities, because they're the key to ensure the continued success of fundamental neuroscience research. With that, and I think this ends our presentation, we'd like to start um, questions openings. Yes, thank you so much, Jen and Tim, um, Lynn and Walter for your presentation. We are commencing the Q&A part of the webinar. Uh, first, I want to remind everyone that the slides and presentation um, recording will be available on the NINDS FNWG webpage in about a week. Um, so please look out for that. Um, so seeing, uh, and, and I would like to welcome our attendees to submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, not seeing any yet, I will start with um, one of the questions we received to the FN mailbox. Um, so I'm going to direct this one to Jin. Um, why did you focus on cellular and molecular neuroscience? Yeah, so I um, briefly alluded um, early on is that um, we felt that with the brain initiatives on connectomics that's uh, elucidating the complexity of the neural circuits and, and the details of connections, as well as um, the ex, uh, expanded information on single cell transcriptomes. And we felt that to understand the fundamental to the development of the nervous system is actually at the cellular level. And that's where we felt that we need to put molecules onto cellular structures. And um, additional reason we also thought is because human diseases, a lot of them in the end um, impinge on the genes, our understanding how gene functions um, in real nervous system. So that's where we focus on cellular molecular neuroscience. Thank you, Jen. And I see, Walter, you're um, writing a, an answer to the question in the box. Um, if you would like to address it live, um, I'll just read it aloud. Can you speak to what may guide a fit for NINDS versus NIMH in fundamental neuroscience? Um, well, I think that you know some of these areas is tremendous overlap, and we work really well together. Um, so in the brain initiative, it's a it's a joint process. So, you know, anything that we're thinking of doing, we would certainly include NIMH in and in that space. Thank you, Walter. Um, I see another question in the box. It's very encouraging to see that current advances are promising. However, it requires equipment and infrastructure that is likely unavailable to most labs and researchers. How do you propose not to alienate the majority of labs? Tim, would you like to take this one? Sure. I mean, I, I think with all technology development, it's a bit hard to predict the future of the cost structure. I mean, 30 years ago, when I witnessed the birth of multi-photon microscopy, it could only be done for a variety of reasons in maybe four labs in the world. Right? Today, there, it's in every department of neuroscience that exists practically. Um, so it took, it took a lot of runway to get it to that level. I, I would say the same thing. 30 years ago, genome sequencing, of course, was unimaginably expensive. Of course, that one scaled quickly, so the cost came way down. Now no one worries about cost of sequencing genomes largely for these things. It's a little bit hard to predict what will happen to the costs. We're encouraging that one goes in this direction, the more people that try to do it. Um, you know, it could be S10 type of grants, could be something else. It's a little hard to predict. I mean, I, I think we want to encourage, you can you could bite off bits of this and trying to develop the key technologies for a little piece of it, uh, not necessarily go to the end point of 10 years from now, doing it within a whole brain that requires all these expensive things. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying to catalyze the starting point. Um, we don't know where the finish line is or how to exactly how to get there yet. Thank you, Tim. Um... I would like to acknowledge your comment in the box. I'll just read it aloud. Um, although these ideas are nice, the funding required for this level of imaging is simply not able to be supported by a single R01 type of grant. Many PIs have to settle for less. 
unless there is dedicated support for acquiring such scopes. Many institutions cannot even propose studies like this. Um, I'd like to move now to the next question. Um, this one I'll, I'll toss over to Dr. John Nye. How do you think this focus on cellular and molecular neuroscience will connect the resources and insights generated through the brain initiative efforts at the systems level? Thanks, Christina. Uh, great question. I'm John Nye, director of the NIH Brain Initiative. The, the main focus of the Brain Initiative is to develop tools to better understand how neural circuits underlie behavior in health and disease. Uh, now, I guess it's a truism that without cells, there would be no, nothing to circuit. So it all kind of fits a piece into, into a larger piece. Understanding how uh, individual cells, whether they be neurons or, or, or glia, contribute to the function of circuits will depend on their individual and specific physiologies. And one thing that the Brain Initiative has done is develop tools to get at all to get at these issues. So, for example, uh, Tim and Jin mentioned great advances in single cell sequencing. So, Brain has been at the forefront of developing multi-omic analysis of cells. Now, we need to functionalize that information into, into toward understanding how cells function. And single cell sequencing isn't just a descriptive technique; it's a great assay for cell function. Similarly. Uh, Brain Initiative has, has contributed to the development of some of the microscopy techniques, one of which Tim mentioned, the Exospin uh, microscope that was developed uh, at the Allen Institute. And we've made great advances in developing various genetically encoded sensors, as well as switches, and Tim mentioned that as well. So sensors for calcium, it's been a great uh, convergence of development of, volt of voltage uh, sensors, sensors for second messengers, uh, neurotransmitters, other metabolites. So the idea here is to apply these tools, not just to understand circuit function, but also to understand the molecular physiological function of, of the cells themselves. Thank you, John. I think Kelsey had a, a response to the previous comment. Yeah, I just, I wanted to add to um, Tim's comments and it was really a, the question about whether, um, you know, some universities and investigators would be excluded from some of this type of research and also, you know, the comment that um, many re researchers can't do these types of experiments with the single R1 and the funding level. And so one of the things that the panel did talk about is how to generate greater access to facilities, shared facilities that would have um, the, the types of instrumentation equipment that's necessary. A good example are the national cryo-EM facilities that um, enable investigation at that level of resolution of, of proteins and cells. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, Dr. Korshatz, I see you're typing an answer to the next question. Um, I will... I will pause to, to let you continue typing unless uh, you want to answer live. Let's see, we have another question coming in. Um, so I will, I will go over to that okay. one. Do you want to answer live, Walter? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so the question is, what do we do with the recommendations? And, um, you know, we have this working group is one of many that we, <clears throat> we have put together for different reasons uh, on different areas. And so we bring the recommendations to the council. We might uh, you know, message them out to the community a bit more. We get our council input, and and then we bring them in house and and try to uh, you know budget permitting, uh, find funding to move some of these things forward. Uh, in general, we can't do everything, but uh, we can do pretty much anything. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. And I'm going to stick with you for this next question in the box. Um, to achieve the goal of fostering access to key technologies through core facilities and supporting the staff scientists who are experts in these technologies, will NINDS bring back the P30 core center grant mechanism? Um, I think uh, so. We have we have been thinking about. Uh, this question, which has come up here on uh, how do you build, you know, really strong neuroscience across the country, um, which would create more jobs uh, across the country. Um, and, you know, one thing we think about is, uh, is uh, funding 
the the kind of equipment expenses that are needed and, and have been brought up and are are just expanding. And uh, so we have thought about that in the past, uh, focusing on what we call emerging neuroscience programs, where there's enough evidence that there's a real impetus on the part of the university to build, and that uh, these kind of um, you know, equipment purchases might be something that would spur things to happen. So that's that's what we thought about in the past, but I think you know this this again brings up the conversation and, and I think it will mature over time uh, due to the work of this uh, working group. Thank you, Walter. I'm gonna uh, direct the next question to Tim. Can you explain how this research might tie into understanding the mechanistic impact, environmental exposures, chemical toxicants, ionizing, non-ionizing radiation, et cetera, on the nervous system? Sure. I mean, I, we, of course, didn't pick that particular subtopic to di discuss in any detail, but I, I view it as it highly overlapping with what we care about because I'll, I'll take the example of if... Uh, you know, we know there's a, a gene mutation that is highly associated with, say, a horrible disease, Alzheimer's, for example. What, what we what we need to understand is the role of that particular gene product, right? So there, there we're hoping that understanding that all the things we pointed out, we need to understand. I would say the same is true if you'd say ionizing radiation or, tox or an environmental exposure. One of the gaps we're missing is we don't understand a lot of the cell biology well enough to actually come up with answers to why you might be susceptible to a particular, why a particular environmental exposure might be damaging to the cell. Because we, we are not approaching it at the circuit level. That's, you know, if, if it's really manifest only at the circuit level, it is not something we address. But I think to understand most of these issues, you, you need to dig down to this sort of molecular organization and fundamental cell biology. And that's one of the things we've emphasized. Thank you, Tim. Um, the next question I will ask uh, Dr. Kelsey Martin to respond to. Uh, there are many open questions that have driven the generation of innovative concepts with potential deep impact in our understanding of many cellular processes. An example is hysteresis, molecular memory, and protein function. Because this type of questions require conventional techniques that can be seen as not exciting, how innovative concepts will be explicitly addressed in the recommendations? How will they? Yeah, I would just say that. Um... Uh, it's. I think everybody on the panel really felt that new, one of the excitements, we focused a lot on new tools and technologies because they enable sort of higher resolution insights. But that doesn't mean that older techniques aren't incredibly valuable. Biochemical techniques can be incredibly valuable. And I think it's the combination of using the whole suite of technologies and tools together with more um, sort of recently developed that that will come together. I, I think that that gets at the point of, you know, how do we have the scientific community kind of broaden its thinking about uh, the importance of fundamental questions and the best approach to um, addressing those questions. But I don't think there was any ever any sense that um, the tools themselves are what's what's exciting. It's rather the questions that those tools enable um, investigation of. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, for this next one, I'm going to invite uh, some of our, three of our panelists actually to give perspectives. Um, so Jen, Tim, and John, um, thank you for the impressive perspective you shared. However, it seemed that the program is focused on a mesoscale imaging and structural biology. It can be roughly summarized as study the molecules in action. Am I understanding that correctly? but it seems that it won't get us closer to answering the systems level questions of cognition and behavior. Does it mean that you won't, that you don't foresee approachable problems on a system neuroscience front? Yeah, so I start by answer this is actually Tim and I um, did consider at the very early um, phase of forming this fundamental neuroscience working group. And we felt that we'll be better off to target a particular areas where the strengths of um, both us and also the group work together. And that's why we focus on cellular and molecular neuroscience. But the system neuroscience is sort of in between what we're proposed versus the brain initiative connectomes. And perhaps it's 
next to frontiers to think about? Tim? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, I, I view one of the challenges of understanding something as high, high level as cognition is that we, we do need surgical tools. And I mean this in the sense of things that are reductionist and precise that we can go in and say, oh, I think that this process is involved as a fundamental step, let's say in memory formation, you know, that's been tried, but I would say we, we, it, we, we probably didn't quite crack that one, but you know, I, th I think there's a lot of bandwidth still to, to try and achieve detailed molecular toolkits that allow us to make manipulations that could then inform questions about cognition. Uh, those worlds have not bridged together very closely yet, but I think we need advancements uh, at the meso scale to do it. Yeah, if I can just follow on, but understanding uh, processes like memory uh, will require complementary approaches. We'll need to understand processes that happen at the synapse. I think that's pretty pretty darn clear over the past dec few decades of research, as well as how these synapses connect to different parts of the nervous system. But I, I think one of the goals of this fundamental uh, neuroscience working group is not to not to uh, suggest where to build new silos, but where to where to where are the gaps that will help us uh, fill in, in, in this, this kind of knowledge. So I, I view this effort as finding areas of uh, gaps and opportunities, but also complementarity uh, with what else is going on across the NIH, including what's going on in brain. So ultimately, you know, I think many of us are interested in similar big problems, but we, we approach them at different levels. And, and again, the, the strength here will be to identify areas where we can strengthen up, where we, where we don't have uh, the focus on, and then hopefully down the line, let them dovetail to give us this bigger picture. Thank you, John. Okay, Walter is typing um, to the remaining question in the box. Oh, um, I Okay, uh, I'm going to let Walter, uh, oh, sorry, um, I see another one at, at the top of the box here. Um, thank you for the impressive perspective you shared. However, it seems that the program is focused on a mesoscale. Oh no, I'm so sorry. We just um, I have a question. Um, I've just completed my master's in clinical psychology. I want to dive deeper into neuroscience because I got fascinated by how impressive our brain is. But I'm confused as this field is incredibly huge. What advice would you give to a student who's looking for their way into the field of neuroscience to choose the right direction? Um, Lynn, did you want to speak to this one? And we can include this in your wrap up. Um, it's kind of appropriate to do it that way. Yes, absolutely. I wanted to highlight um, a point that was just made, which is that we really charge the working group of council to focus more on the what um, and less on the how. So really to focus on um, what are the gaps and what are the opportunities that we're missing in fundamental neuroscience. And that NINDS then in terms of next steps, um, the first next step is going to be present these recommendations to the NANDS Council for discussion and comment, and then internally NINDS will be looking at this. There was considerable discussion amongst the working group about um, training opportunities, about making sure that we didn't lose um, new young individuals who wanted to go into these fields. Um, and so we have noted that that comment, and that's very important, and that will probably come into play um, when we think about implementation opportunities. Um, so what I wanted to do was, first of all, thank the panel for um, your participation and all the work going into today. And I think in addition, um, I want to thank all of the attendees for your um, just your involvement, your great questions, and for remaining interested and engaged in this acti activity. Um, I wanted to remind you that we are open for additional comments on these recommendations. Um, the email address is at the bottom of this slide, but it's very simple to remember. It's fn at nih.gov. Please send your additional comments or any questions that you felt um, were not fully answered and you want to clarify. Um, we are going to be monitoring that and looking at those closely. Um, and I think with that, I wanted to, again, thank everybody. and. Um, and I want to remind all of the working group members that um, after this meeting closes, we are going to have a closed meeting for a debriefing and discussion of um, your next steps um, immediately after this. So please log out, um, log into the new Zoom that starts um, after this is over. Um, unless I missed anything else, Christina. 
Thank you, and I'm sorry we weren't able to get to everyone's questions. Um, please submit them to the FN at NIH.gov mailbox, and we will answer them there. Thank you all so much for attending. Have a great day.